Hello everybody, I'm Roxy and this is Written BS. Today I bring you part two of my June wrap up and yes, I recorded this right after I recorded the first part. It's an editing thing, not a filming thing, okay? I have six books to tell you about, so let's get on with it. First, I have The Overstory by Richard Powers, which I mentioned first in my Springathon TBR, link down below, and I never wrapped it up because I've been buddy reading it with Natalie from A Curious Reader, link down below to her channel, of course. We had just so much fun talking about this because it's such an interesting book. It's a great book to buddy read and discuss. It's basically about ecological activism and our place on that ecosystem as human beings and our responsibility in saving it since we as a species have been a great part of what is wrecking it. It is divided into three sections, so it's roots, trunk, crown and seeds. And the roots part is just worth the entire book. It reads like a short story collection where each short story presents not only the life story of a character, but literally like the whole existence story. So it starts with their grandparents sometimes, their ancestors. It's just so epic and amazing setup and the writing is so good and it has so many great references. The writing I thought was great and it has this almost epic tone that just works very well with what the novel is trying to do. That said, it is ultimately disappointing, it is very anticlimactic, but in a way that I think could not really be avoided because the setup is so epic that once you release these characters into real life, it just cannot measure up. You would have to change history, thus making the novel less convincing and just change the way everything works in order to make this a more satisfying ending. So I think in a way, Richard Powers set himself up for failure that way. But at the same time, you can't avoid it. And it still makes for great literature. And it does make it such a smart and enjoyable book. Now, some of the characters I couldn't care about because they are archetypical. And then some others have a lot more depth. My favorite was Patricia. She is a scientist and she's amazing. But other than that, I thought the characters worked really well with what the book was doing. By the middle section, it becomes about activism and then the consequences of that activism. I uh, completely lost my train of thought because my mom just called. <laughs> Everything has happened today. Anyways, um, so yeah, this. Uh, it becomes less put together as it unfolds. One character in particular, Neely, could have been used so much better. That was a missed opportunity. So I enjoyed this. I think I will reread it, especially because you can tell there is a lot of tree symbolism in here that I went completely over my head. I could have Googled it, but again, I didn't want to interrupt the reading experience. So I would like to read this in a more analytical way. I think it's a really smart, interesting book. It's the kind of book that I love to read. I also read the End of Eddie by Edward Yui, and this is translated by Michael Luzzi. This was really, really good. So I actually got it right every time I talked about it. It's about a poor boy growing up in a village in rural France. Almost a memoir. It really, he called it a novel just to have some possible deniability, I feel like, because it really is all about him growing up in this place he kind of hates but he also wants to give a voice to i read an interview with him in the paris review i will link it down below basically he says that although he loves literature and he found so much solace in it once he got out of here and started studying he talks about the political novel and how a lot of people think it's dead but to him it's actually very important and his work is very political in the way that it doesn't try to be propagandistic, explicitly give you a message, but just give a voice to this very marginalized aspect of French culture. In the interview he talks about how much of the language of arts is always so stylized that makes people from his background feel relegated from it and feel like they don't have a place in art. So he wrote this not only as a way of cleansing his demons, but also as a way of showing that language can be artful and can be poetic 
it fits violent and gruesome. This novel is very violent, not in a gratuitous way, but it is very just open wounds. Like he will not shield you of anything. He doesn't have to, of course, but that was a very deliberate choice. I love that it's not like poverty porn, which is a really terrible expression, but that exists. But it really tells it like it is in a way. It tells you about the things that Eddie enjoyed growing up, the things that made him happy, but also talks about the extreme homophobia. Eddie is a very effeminate kid even before he realized he was gay, but he wasn't a complete outcast. He still hang out with people, he still had friends in a way, so it's interesting to see that all the dimensions of Eddie growing up. Two things that were fascinating that I wasn't expecting because yes, the masculinity and the homophobia I knew were coming, but also the examination of gender in lower classes and also the idea of class was so fascinating. And again, it does so in a way that is not preachy at all. He really does show you, and I have a lot of problems with the show Don't Tell Maxine, but in this case, it's really amazing how he is telling you his story, but it's like he's showing it. The way he delves into the subjectivity of the other characters in a way that's really humane, but also very harsh. It's just so good. Then an actual reread, Peter and Alice by Joan Logan. As you can see from this beautiful cover by Oberon Books, which is my preferred source of plays, together with Favor and Favor. It originally starred the brilliant Ben Wishaw as Peter and the brilliant Dame Judi Dench as Alice. I would probably try to sell a kidney if I could travel back in time to see them perform this play. I want to see it anyway because it's that good, but to see them, I don't know what I would give <laughs> to do that. This is about the inspirations for Alice in Wonderland and Peter Pan, respectively, meeting at the Lewis Carroll Centennial that was celebrated in 19 something, 1932. Alice is going to give a speech and Peter, who is in the publishing business, wants to convince her she should write her memoirs. And they start talking while they wait to go into the event. Now, this was a real life event in the sense that both of them attended. They probably talked to each other and Alice Little did give a speech. But of course, everything else that's recorded here is fiction and it's so good. It's about how setting up these kids as archetypes for childhood kind of messed up their lives, but also how this relationship with these men, which were really inappropriate, shaped them as individuals. In a way, it's the ultimate news story. Like, <sighs> so, um, everything's different. They <laughs> couldn't go back to filming that day. I thought of reshooting the whole thing, but Honestly, I didn't want to. So let's just move on. I was talking about Peter and Alice. I don't remember if I had described the whole thing. And can you hear that? I should have filmed a different day, but I really need to film right now. So let's just power through. I'll try to edit it later and see if I can reduce the noise. If not, please bear with me. I promise you this book is worth it. So it's heartbreaking. The dialogue is brilliant. It's very simple, but it has a lot of transformations. It features the authors. It features the fantasy versions of the children. It's really good. I really recommend it. Then I read What I Talk When I Talk About Running by Haruki Murakami. This was actually not on my TBR. I think I already talked about this, didn't I? Okay. I should have reviewed the footage, but anyways. This is a memoir about his life as a runner and his life as an author and how those two passions intersect and how Murakami's life philosophy influences both of these passions. It was fascinating. I do not have a strong opinion about Murakami as an author, as a fiction author, I mean, but I've always enjoyed his nonfiction. Oh, I talked about this in my uh, mid-year freakout tag. I'm going to link that down below. Oh my god, this was really really good. It's also very soothing to read. He has a very straightforward and simple but observant way of writing. I like how he talks here specifically about 
what it feels like to run at different stages. I am not a runner and I probably never will. There's some mental aspect of running that just doesn't gel with me. I don't think my personality is right for that. So seeing what he thinks about running and just reading what it feels like was really, really good. Those were all the physical books. Now I want to tell you about three ebooks. It's the music book section. I purposefully left the section for last so i got to geek out and not putting anyone through that if you are not interested you can leave you have my permission if you don't want to hear about the music books although they were pretty great so i think you should stay but if not just leave a comment down below if you're interested in reading any or all of these books or if you have read them what did you think let's get on with the music books i read at the very beginning of the month the Secret Lives of the Great Composers by Elizabeth Lunday. Yes, I wrote them down today. So, you know, preparedness. This was really, really fun to read. So it's basically short biographies slash profiles of most major composers of Western music, classical music. And it's just the perfect choice if you are already kind of into classical music, but you don't know a lot about it and you want to get a broad overview of the main composers and what their contributions have been in a way that's funny and fun. It, this is just perfect. So it starts with like a life chart, which includes the composer's astrological sign, but it also includes like their most famous pieces and where you might have heard them. So that's great. And the period in which they are situated, so like romantic or classical or baroque, etc. I loved the feminist commentary that was embedded in the whole book, but there is a special chapter, small chapter, dedicated to how women have been relegated. And I like that it finishes with gaming music. So it talks about music for games like Legend of Zelda, for example. Orchestras are now playing them and it's like a new iteration of classical music. It's not super detailed, but as an introduction, I think it reaches that sweet spot of being about the music itself and being a bit gossipy and entertaining in terms of biography. So yeah, really, really enjoyed it. Then I want to talk about The Maestro Myth by Norman Lebrecht, or Lebrecht, which I also loved. On the one hand is the history of conducting and conductors. Before it would be just like the composer directing from the piano or the violin. There was not this idea of a conductor that wasn't a musician in the orchestra himself. And it explains how and why that changed. And then it chronicles the rise of the conductor as this main figure and how they became basically celebrities. And then how they became less relevant as time went on. This was a revised edition. The end of the first edition is pretty grim, but then the epilogue to the revised edition was much more optimistic, which I think is the right way of approaching this. In any case, it was very interesting. It has been criticized because it's very gossipy. Fair enough, it is. But I enjoyed it. I learned so much. And also it's not unjustified. He does expose a lot of problems with the industry. Another criticism is that the author is not objective, but I don't think he ever claimed to be. This is not a history book. It does have the history of the conductor, but the name is not like conducting through the ages. It's the maestro myth because his main objective is to analyze how conductors became these mythical figures and the effect that that has had in the classical music landscape, especially during the 20th century and how it carries over to the 21st. Crosswise, I think it was okay, just very neutral. I think it gets the job done. It's very pragmatic, but it's not dry either. It's just what it is. My only criticism is that the structure gets messier because at the beginning, you're dealing with individual conductors chronologically, and then it gets thematic in a way. You move in time a little bit, but then when you go back to analyze a different conductor, you kind of go back in time, but also go a bit forward. And it's just a bit awkward. I got lost and I think I need to reread it, um, especially the latter sections. I really, really appreciated the chapter on people who have been historically relegated from the podium, namely people of color and women, and how 
explicitly homosexual conductors have also been discriminated even though we know and everyone back then knew some specific conductors were gay they had to pretend they weren't because there is this idea of virility associated to the figure of the conductor and that just sucks. Yeah, really recommend this. Then the last book I want to mention is one of the best books that I've read so far this year, The Boozy's Paris by Katherine Kautsky. I love this book but it is very niche and I can't really imagine someone who isn't deeply interested in the Boozy's music already wanting to pick this up because when I first picked it up, I thought it was going to be more of a social history in a way, like it was going to tie Debussy's music to the context and go more into the context than the music itself. And it's actually the other way around, which to me was perfect. I really, really loved it. What it does actually is go through all the influences or main influences in Debussy's music. So for example, circus and clowns, orientalism, symbolist poetry, nationalism, so all of those things. And it breaks them down, it talks about the music structure itself, which was amazing. I had to reread those uh, sections a lot because I'm like just learning that. But it was so good. I mean, the analysis of the Sweet Parker masks was, oh my God. And it talked a lot about not only Debussy himself, and his music, but also like music that was going on at the time and art that was going on at the time. So although this is technically general public, I would say this is much more academic than anything else. It veers more towards that. It's just like a literary criticism book, but with music. So if you do like Debussy and are looking for a very thorough cultural slash musical interpretation of his works, then this is the book for you. If not, then probably some of the other books that I'm going to read on the Boozy and the Belle Epoque are more <laughs> what you're looking for. So I have a lot of ebooks on the Boozy. After I get to them all, it'll be like a spotlight. It's very niche. I don't think a lot of people will be very interested. But if you are, please drop me a comment or like talk to me on Instagram or Twitter because I will want to talk to you. <laughs> In any case, this was incredible. I was just so taken with the scholarship, so well done, it's so fascinating. It's something that I didn't know existed, but I loved it. So that was The Busy's Paris. I hope you enjoyed this video. Just by filming it, I know it was a mess. So I hope I can savage it in editing if I'm trying my best. This will be up, I think, during reading rush. So I will be just reading, reading, reading. Very excited about that. And yeah, see you next time. <laughs>